So in case you guys missed it, I bought my dream shop over the summer, which is super exciting, but there's also a ton of work to be done to get this place renovated. And since I published my shop tour video back in October, I've been working on things in the background and I'll have a bunch of videos coming up showing you the work I've done. So the first thing I tackled after filming the shop tour video was having the old ratty insulation removed. And getting this stuff out of the way was step one since I knew I'd need access to those floor joists for all the framing and electrical work I'll be doing here. I paid an insulation company to remove and dispose of the old insulation and honestly didn't get much footage of the removal process because of the insane amount of dust that came down while the insulation was being removed. And this building was a cabinet shop for many years prior to me purchasing it, and evidently the dust generated by the shop worked its way into every nook and cranny of the insulation. After the insulation was removed, there was a solid quarter to half inch layer of dust on every surface in the shop, and I had my work cut out for me cleaning everything up. I spent a few hours here with a shop vac getting up the bulk of the material, and my buddy Seth from Burn Peak also let me borrow his Makita robotic vacuum to help continue the cleanup process. The next step in the cleanup process was getting rid of all the junk the previous owner had left behind, including this very questionable wall in the middle of the spray booth. And I'm pretty sure there was a very specific horticultural purpose for building this wall, if you catch my drift, but I wanted the space back so I demoed the wall and got rid of the materials. I'd also just received a big delivery of all of the drop ceiling tiles and ceiling grid from Armstrong Ceilings, which I had to hand unload into the shop. And next I wanted to move these tiles into the spray booth to get them out of the way for the time being. Unfortunately, I didn't have a great way to move the pallets, but thankfully the folks from Global Industrial, who are the sponsor of this week's video, came to my rescue by sending me one of their amazing electric pallet jacks. and unboxing this thing kind of felt like Christmas morning for me, and after getting the crate disassembled, it fired right up with a full charge nonetheless, and I, of course, had to play around with the pallet jack a little first and decided to move the shipping crate around a bit, which it, of course, had no trouble with since this thing can lift 3,300 pounds. After getting the hang of the controls, I decided to go for it and move the ceiling tiles into the spray booth, and man, this pallet jack was already paying for itself in the time it saved me. So I got all three pallets moved into the spray booth in a matter of minutes, and then I could unbox some more goodies from Global Industrial, starting with this utility cart. So since this new shop is obviously a lot larger than my old shop, carts and dollies are gonna be used constantly for moving materials and tools around the shop, and I figured a utility cart would be incredibly handy for keeping things organized. I also got this monster of a fan from Global Industrial, and this thing moves a serious amount of air and will be great for pushing dust and fumes out of the shop. Last, but certainly not least, and one of the things I was most excited about was this power scissor lift table. And my buddy Mike Farrington has one of these in his shop, and ever since I saw it, I knew I wanted one in my shop. And I'll be building a workbench top for this in a future video and can't wait to have a height adjustable workbench for when I'm working on larger or smaller projects. Continuing the demolition process, I jumped over to the addition, the leftmost kind of hallway looking section of my new shop and demoed the sagging particle board shelving and plywood platform the shelving was sitting on. And this revealed some mold buildup, probably from some water leaking in under this plywood platform over the years, as I know this area sees water infiltration if it rains hard enough. To help neutralize the mold, I sprayed on a heavy coat of this mold removal spray, and this seems to have done the trick as there is no visible mold now, and we haven't had any water come in lately, which is a big relief. The insulation was then removed in this area, and evidently I had a little friend living up in the ceiling of this addition at some point, as evidenced by this snakeskin, and just another thing to look forward to, I guess. So I decided to go ahead and spruce up this hallway area a little bit while I was at it, since I knew I'd be storing a lot of stuff in here during the shop renovation process, and the first thing on the agenda was to get some better lighting installed. And I went with my favorite shop lighting, these American Green Lights LED shop lights, and I've installed these LEDs in all three of my past and current shops now. And American Green Lights LEDs have a super high CRI or color rendering index, meaning they're great for filming, but also for seeing accurate color versus fluorescence. So my initial plan was to attach these American Green Lights fixtures directly to the old fluorescent fixtures after removing the bulbs, but I quickly scrapped this idea as I really wanted to do the install the right way. 
So instead, I ran a line of two by fours perpendicular to the ceiling joists so I could attach the lights anywhere along the line and then came back and installed the fixtures. Also, my buddy Alex from the single track sampler was staying at the shop at this point and having a second set of hands during this process was super helpful. I connected the fixtures to each other with MC cable, which is a metal jacketed wire suitable for this type of commercial environment. And I went over this installation process in detail in my previous shop build series if you want to go check that out. After getting everything wired up, I could turn the power back on to the lights and thankfully they fired right up. First shot. Next, I needed a way to control these lights more easily as there wasn't a switch wired on this circuit for some reason. And to make this easy, I added a Lutron switch to the existing junction box and could then pair a Lutron Pico remote to the switch to control it remotely without having to run more conduit. And these Pico remotes are amazingly useful and can be installed anywhere and with the addition of a wall plate, they look just like a wired switch. The batteries also last forever in my experience. I've never had to change one after having these switches at my house for like three years. And I'll link to the exact switch I used in the video description below. Once that was done, I got the old fluorescent lights removed and also cleaned out the cavities between the joists while I was at it since they were pretty nasty. With the lighting handled, I got prepped to paint this big wall in this hallway by vacuuming up the floor and the walls themselves. And since I was going to be using a paint sprayer, anything on the floor could be blown onto the walls, so I made sure to be really thorough here. Next, I masked off the floor in the area I'd be painting and then I could get the sprayer set up. And I'm still getting the hang of the setup process, but once I got things dialed in, the painting process went insanely quickly. So I used a Graco Magnum X7 airless sprayer, and I will never go back to rolling paint on the walls. I was able to get a coat on this roughly 500 square foot wall in less than 15 minutes, which is just insane. After getting two coats on the area, I removed the masking material, and then I could start getting some stuff loaded into the addition. So as I mentioned in the shop tour, I had gotten these awesome industrial racks and storage totes from Craftsman to use in this space. And I started by getting the racks assembled, which was a pretty simple process. And the biggest difficulty was figuring out how I wanted to space the shelves to best fit these totes and deciding how high to go since you can stack these racks up to about 10 feet tall. And my idea here was to have all of these plastic totes dedicated to different types of work. For example, I can have a tote for siding, roofing, drywall, concrete, whatever, and I can grab a tote and throw it in my truck when I need to do that type of work. And unfortunately, the big move for my old shop happened before I could wrap up the storage area, so now it looks like this. So as you might have noticed, I stopped short when painting this wall, and that's because I knew I wanted to come back and waterproof this back section where some water had gotten in a few months back during some rather torrential rains here in Asheville. And luckily there's been no water getting in since then, but I figured applying a few coats of dry lock, a waterproofing paint, definitely wouldn't hurt, so I had Nate get that knocked out. I was also seeing some water coming in on the other side of the shop, and this was a little bit more concerning to me since I knew I'd be covering up these walls with framing and plywood. So I really wanted to get this dealt with properly. So as you might be able to tell, these walls were in pretty rough shape, and it looked like the previous owner just kept applying more coats of dry lock to try and fix the problem without addressing the root cause. So I wanted to get the problem areas back to the bare concrete block first before waterproofing, and I thought it was gonna take a heck of a lot of work to remove the paint. But instead, as you can see, the paint chipped off in really big sections without too much effort, especially once I switched over to an SDS drill with a tile scraping bit. At the bottom of the wall, I ran into some mold, which was to be expected since the dry lock was basically trapping water between the paint and the block. So Nate got to work stripping the rest of the paint, making sure to wear a respirator in case there was lead paint on this wall and to prevent breathing the mold spores. Once the bulk of the loose paint was removed, Nate came back and sprayed on more of that mold neutralizing spray I used in the addition, and this stuff seemed to work great. And in the time lapse, you can even see the color of the mold change, which seems to me like it means this stuff was doing its job. Over the next few days, we had a good bit of rain here in Asheville, and now that the dry lock was removed, we could see just how much water was trying to work its way through the block, and this confirmed that all of this waterproofing work would be worth the effort. And concrete block is super porous, and there's no waterproofing on the outside of these walls, so it makes sense that there was a ton of water trying to get in. There were still a few areas of loose paint higher up on the walls, so Nate got to work removing those with the SDS drill, along with a wire brush on the angle grinder. 
and we had waited to use the angle grinder until after dealing with the mold just so it wouldn't be kicked up into the air in the shop. Once we were satisfied with the paint removal, we could finally get started waterproofing, starting by using this concrete etch and cleaner. And this stuff removes efflorescence from the concrete, and efflorescence is a buildup of salt deposits on the surface of the block. And there were tons of craggy spots along the wall where the efflorescence had formed behind the paint. This etch is applied with a stiff brush and then rinsed with water to neutralize the acid in the etch. Once the concrete was etched, we could come back and patch any problem areas with hydraulic cement, which is a fast drying cement designed to plug holes where water is working its way through concrete. And if you're working with this stuff, you only want to mix about as much as you can use in 10 minutes, as this stuff sets up super quick once it's mixed. And it started by adding hydraulic cement along the joint where the concrete block met up with the slab, as this area was where a lot of the water was working its way through. He also filled any big cracks in the block as these are areas where air and moisture could easily penetrate through the walls. And Nate went through the entire 10 pound bucket of this hydraulic cement fixing the block and once that was done, he could finally get the dry lock applied. Since block is such an uneven surface, you need to use a roller with a pretty large nap and we used a 3 quarter inch nap roller in this case. And Nate applied the first coat with the roller, working it in as much as possible, and then came back with a brush to fill in any pinholes, joints, or other areas the roller couldn't fill. And you want a super consistent film of dry lock to have the most effective waterproofing. Nate then repeated the process for a second and third coat, repeating the process of rolling on the dry lock and then filling any pinholes with the brush, and the entire five gallon bucket of dry lock was used up on these walls. And he got this done just in time as the Perkins Builder Brothers crew came out to help start the framing process here in the new shop a week or so later, and thankfully the walls were essentially watertight. Now, I should mention that waterproofing the inside of these walls is really just phase one, as the most effective way to deal with this kind of water intrusion is on the outside of the walls. Now, I've already cleaned off the roof and gotten the gutters working better, which helped move water away from the building. And the next step will be barring excavator to do some dirt work around the building. And my goal will be to create positive drainage to help move more water away instead of the current negative drainage, which pushes tons of water towards the walls. Please go ahead and get subscribed and ring that notification bell. Also, I'll link to all the tools and products I use in the video description below. Again, big shout out to Global Industrial for sponsoring this video. And last, if you guys want to support the channel, I've got merch available. I sell plans for a lot of the furniture and projects I've built, and I have Patreon and YouTube memberships set up. So if you guys want to check that out, I'll have links to all those in the video description as well. All right, thanks for watching, y'all. Again, I am super excited to finally get this started. I know a lot of you guys have been asking, so let's get this going. And until next week, happy building.